introduce our panelists and they're each going to take just a few minutes to introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about their farm and their business model. So first we're going to start with Kirsten um, from Muddy Roots Farm. Hey everybody, I'm Kirsten from Muddy Roots Farm. Uh, I farm with my husband, Chris. He's not here today. Um, he's back at the farm. So we are located in Wallingford, Connecticut, and we are diversified. And so we do vegetables, but because this is a livestock talk, um, I'll focus on that. We are also diversified in our livestock and poultry production. We raise on pasture, um, chickens, turkeys, and pigs. We actually started raising chickens in 2014, 13 or 14. And um, we didn't actually officially start our business until 2016. We registered in February. So this is actually our seventh season, which is kind of awesome and really surreal uh, at the same time. Um, so we have full access on leased land. We don't own it. So we're on leased land and it is my family's property. So it's a little easier to navigate than having to lease from someone we don't really know. We do about an acre of vegetables uh, and then the seven acres for our um, uh, pigs and poultry. As of now, it's just my husband and myself. We do have volunteers um, that that help out. Uh, we do slaughter on the poultry on the farm. And so those volunteers that come out will come out on the days that we slaughter our poultry. Uh, we, let's see, as Nick stated nice and concisely, we operate 12 months out of the year, even though we're very seasonal um, and pasture based. We do a lot of planning in the winter after we do our turkeys, um, after they finish up in around Thanksgiving, we take about a week to kind of decompress and then it's back to planning and figuring out our next season. Um, so back to the poultry processing. That's something that we started doing from day one. We never wanted to ship our birds to a slaughterhouse. And since then we haven't. Um, we're actually in the process of becoming a state inspected uh, processing facility for poultry. Uh, currently, we fall under the Poultry Exemption Act with the USDA as a small um, processor. It allows us to process up to 1,000 birds a year without any real oversight by the state or the government. We've exceeded that number, not, not exceeded, but we have the ability to exceed that number the last few years based on uh, consumer demand. Because of that, we're now obviously trying to get certified so we can increase our numbers to uh, 20,000 chickens and 5,000 turkeys if we so choose. We don't want to go that high, but it is an option for us. It also increases our avenues of sale. Currently, we can only sell to end users, which means the customer who purchases from us has to consume the product and cannot resell it. We also have to sell the animals as uh, live and whole. So I can't sell breast meat uh, or thighs or legs or backs or feet. It has to be the whole thing that the um, consumer is purchasing from us. With the certification from the state, we'll be able to wholesale uh, all of our poultry. We'll also be able to break it down into sell in, um, in breasts and we can actually sell the pieces of the meat themselves and not the entire animal. So it gives us a bit of um, flexibility. As far as our pigs, uh, we get them on the farm. We don't raise them. We don't farrow. Um, we get them about seven weeks old and we raise them out. Um, usually we get them in June and they go to the slaughterhouse in uh, October, early November. Those are also sold by the half and whole only. Um, that's our choice. We don't have the storage pace to um, keep meat for very long. So the customer actually will buy the half or whole pig. They'll choose their own cut sheets. Uh, and we'll deliver the animal and then pick up their product for them. Uh, our, most of our products are, like I said, currently sold to end users. Uh, they come to the farm um, to get their orders every couple of weeks when we process the birds. And then once uh, for Thanksgiving and then once again when the pigs are ready. Um, the chickens and the pigs are fed a GMO free uh, grain. We get that local in the States. We would love to move off of corn and soy, or at least soy. Unfortunately, we can't find um, a supplier in the area that can deliver the amount that we go through a year. Um, so that's kind of a restriction on, on us, but we do what we can. Unfortunately, organic feed is just not in the financial uh, ability of ours. We'd have, that we'd have to pass the cost on to the consumer and 
I don't think they're ready for that. Um, we also do bring some of the poultry down to one of our farmers markets in Stanford. Um, the birds are sold at that point. So that is one of the service that we do provide as we do deliver it to the consumers um, at the farmer's market. Hopefully with this, the certification, we can actually just bring uh, meat down there once we're ins inspected and that'll kind of help <laughs> um, move some more of our products a little bit. And we do want to open a farm store uh, within the next year or two. So we're very transparent. Um, we want everybody to know where the food comes from. We want to know how it's raised. Um, we want them to know how it's raised. Uh, we want them to know who we are uh, and put a, a face to the product that they're putting in their their mouths and their families and friends' mouths. So I'm here for any questions you guys have about any of this. Awesome, Kirsten. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, next, we're gonna go to Jenny from Stonehill Farm. Okay, good morning. Give me a minute. All right, can you see my slides? Nancy, can you see my slides? Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. So who are we and how did we get here? So my name is Jenny Kipsakevich. I am an owner operator of Stonehill Farm in Plainfield. My husband, Dan, and I are raising our three children on our farm. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit different spin on things. I really appreciate Nick's video. So I think he captures a lot of um, what we do as um, alternative model farms. So my husband um, was raised fourth generation dairy during the prime of the farm. He milked 250 head of cattle, but the cattle were always sick. They always had hoof issues. They were always um, needing to have treatments and not to mention they had excessively high grain bills. I was raised by self-employed parents, not an agricultural background, um, but in trucking. So, um, we purchased a property in the fall, um, in the fall of 2000, just before we got married, this piece of property went on the market. It happened to be his grandfather selling it due to grain debt. We were unable to rub two cents together, so we had to pass, but three years later, the property was still on the market and we were able to make it happen um, at that time. So we purchased 68 acres. We currently um, farm 35 of it. The blue line is an indicator of our perimeter fencing. Um, so it's a mix between silvo and um, pasture, obviously a work in progress. Um, we consider ourselves first generation farmers um, because we do not have the same farming model as his ancestors and we definitely have a different um, practice than what he has come from. We do both have to work off farm jobs. Um, unfortunately, infrastructure is expensive. Our desire and passion to have agricultural um, Enterprise is not possible without having off-farm jobs. Um, Dan is an engineer and I'm a disabilities administrator, but we use our career strengths of data collection and monitoring, as well as my passion for education to inspire others to embrace agricultural opportunities, as well as to educate and inform our consumers. We spent the first five years of our farming career um, rock picking and creating what we thought was what we were gonna do in agriculture. And that's, that's the picture on the left. We had a pure uh, Timothy stand. We thought we were the bomb. We thought we had great hay. Um, our horse clients loved it. We thought that that was beautiful, you know, pure purple blooms in mid June. But you know what it did? It deprived our soils. We had incredible compaction. Um, we had like no organic matter. Now where we're at is the picture on the right um, where we're very excited. We have species um, and plant diversity. Um, our organic matter is, you know, soaring um, and our animals are thriving. So we started with two head um, and I share this portion of our story. We wish we could have purchased a whole herd, but you know that again, budgetary is not in the cards. We started with two black Angus and over time we, we realized that um, they weren't fitting our model for grass grazing. Um, we exclusively grass graze and um, their frames, their size, their temperament was not what we were looking for. Um, we needed animals that we could handle. We needed animals that had small frame sizes. We aimed for frame size four. Um, and we, we needed them to be able to convert their grass into energy very quickly and have really good weight gains. So we switched over and now we have um, a herd of registered red Angus and registered red Devons. Um, as this meets our model. Um, so we are very happy and, and proud of the genetic work we have done to get to this place of, on our farm. 
Um, and right now we're at about 25 head, give or take who's going in for processing. And we do aspire to hit 40. Obviously we have to always monitor what can we handle with off farm jobs. Okay. So um, the magic happens in our pasture. So um, we believe that our animals are the feed wagon, the mower and the manure spreader. They do all the work and I just navigate the fence lines that keep them where they should be. Um, our chickens free range with our cattle that helps to break down manure. We certainly hope to and aspire to have other species diversification, but again, it comes that work farm balance. Um, we graze because it's important about what we eat. Nick shared it himself in his video that, you know, it started from a desire to eat well ourselves. And then when we realized that friends and family were curious about what we were doing, um, we then started to expand to include feeding other people. We also do it because we want to improve our soils. And I really appreciate the land acknowledgement statement in the beginning because it has always been a mission of ours to leave our farm better than how we have found it, um, better than the day we purchased it. And so um, we have already achieved that goal, but every day we just get better and better about what we do. So um, our extensive grazing practices have improved our soil health, it supports our herd health, and we are impacted by things like drought, or um, parasites because our practices um, support all of those missions and keep it working well. So during the grazing season, which for us is about late April to mid-November, we move our herd every 12 hours um, as this is what I can manage with our off-farm jobs. I am the herd master. I do everything animal related. Um, I do everything in terms of what we call feeding. Um, so feeding obviously is setting fence lines, moving the herd every 12 hours, and then making sure that all of the equipment is operating properly. And Dan tends to be more of the mechanical equipment operator when it comes to hay season, um, as we do produce a portion of our winter feeds. Um, for us, rest is critical um, as grass grazers and to try to improve our soil health. We want to make sure that our land has an opportunity to rest between grazing. So I just include this slide so that you can see the picture on the left is early spring. The picture on the right is only 35 days later. Um, and this is what we do all season long is let our, our animals go in, they eat, they come out, and we let that area rest anywhere from 75 to 95 days, depending on the season. We graze tall. We're not afraid to graze tall grasses. So here's a great example of putting our herd into a really tall area. We leave 50% 50, 50 litter behind, which is always an intentional move on our part. We even have adopted winter rotational grazing. So um, as you have heard from um, two previous farmers, there's like 13 months in a year and 26 hours in a day, and all of them are filled with what we do. So grazing never stops for us. It just looks different. So um, I'm including these slides now as new innovation um, because we do continue to um, partition off our property during the winter months. Um, and move our feeding facility. So in this instance, it is a hay wagon and then we move it periodically. Um, and we are doing data tracking right now to see how we improve our soil health using the winter months to our advantage. So how do we make this all work for us? Um, because, you know, obviously we want to dedicate full-time work to this and, and we hope that someday that that will be in our cards. And I'm not sure which one of us will get to draw the stick and win and quit their other job. But um, for now, we have to continue to work off farm. So we use things like heat patches to detect heat cycles because we are exclusively an artificial insemination program. We use tail mounted devices to detect labor um, so that we can be at our jobs and we get a text and then we drive home. We usually fight over who's closer um, to make it home as we want to be present for all births. Um, that's important. We have two on-demand geothermal water fountains um, that give our cows uh, 65 degree temp water every day, um, no matter what day of the year it is. So these are infrastructure decisions we've made to make farming easier for us. I keep extensive grazing records so that I know on any given point at any given year where we were and what we were doing, what the weather was doing. 
We also collect data. So we do soil samples regularly. We also do dry matter studies. Um, we wanna make sure we know what we're doing and that our practices are working. This doesn't negate that we also do observation. You know, I have a friend that has, does a term called linger grazing and I sit out in my pastures and take pictures. I chuckled when I saw Nick taking a picture in one of his pastures, you know, because that's, that's what you see. You observe the animal, you see what's happening, you see the land. Um, oh my goodness, rain is coming. So you make modifications because you certainly don't want to ruin your soils while we have inclement weather. We also have animal handling equipment. This is used for obviously breeding purposes, but initially this was used to um, weekly weigh our cattle because when we started farming um, back, we officially became a farm in 2008. And there was a lot of naysayers at that time that you could exclusively feed a herd of animals on grass alone. So you just told an engineer and an educator that you can't do something and that was a mistake for them. Um, so we started weighing our cattle every week and proving that we get 2.5 pounds of weight gain a day on grass alone. Our herd is not supplemented with grain in any way. So, you know, these are all tools that we use to help um, enhance our farm. So we sell direct to consumer off the farm by appointment, similar to Nick. Um, we don't have a storefront, but aspire to have one. Uh, I wish I could invest time to spend at a farmer's market, but unfortunately my day job would probably frown upon my leaving early to set up a tent. Um, although I passionately believe that that is a way to connect with consumers to have them understand um, what we do and why we do it. We do have a website that does have hits. Um, we also have an online store, but people tend to prefer to text or email me whatever their wish lists are and we create invoices based on what their needs are. We formerly sold in a, health, a small health food store in our community that has since closed because they retire, retired. But I do wanna point out celebrations. So the best thing that could have ever happened to our farm was COVID. Um, it was terrible for our personal and professional careers, but the best thing that happened to our farm because consumers started to educate themselves about high quality food and wanting to source what they ate locally. So I agree with the sentiments of Nick and Kirsten that there are people out there who want to buy what we do and there's plenty of room for other people to become like us. Um, our farm always welcomes visitors for any at any time so that we can elaborate to you on what our successes were, what our missteps were, and where we are headed. So thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to sit on this panel. Uh, Jenny, thank you so much for sharing that. We really appreciate um, all that you're doing and all the details and all the great steps that you're doing um, for raising your cattle. Um, I'm going to hop over to Karen now. Um, to give her the floor for a few minutes so we can learn about her farm and operation. Karen, I think you're, there you go. All right, go ahead. Hi, I'm Karen Kalinowskis, and uh, we are not as new a farm as um, some of the ones that you have heard from. And I'm representing our two farm businesses <clears throat> Kalinowskis Farm is our original farm business. And we raise beef, uh, corn silage for the beef, hay products, both square, round, and um, wrapped, and we make pine shavings for our use and for sale. Um, we usually have 80 to 90 beef on the farm, and we hay over 400 acres annually. Uh, Karen's Lambs is my business, uh, raising and selling lambs and goats. I have rabbits, poultry, alpacas, some geese, and three livestock guardian dogs. I have about 100 sheep and 20 goats along with the other species. Uh, since I retired from my job, uh, I am full-time on the farm and the businesses are supported by my brother, sister, nephews, and nieces, all who have um, off-farm jobs and some extended family and friends as well as some local vocational agriculture students. Uh, the farm was bought from a local owner over several years by my grandfather with complete ownership in 1914. So we're the third, fourth, and fifth generations on the farm. Our livestock sales are on the farm, primarily to first and second generation immigrants, and we have an active following of Muslim customers as well. We opened an on-the-farm market a year and a half ago in response to public requests, offering USDA beef and lamb products, fiber from the sheep and alpacas, 
as well as eggs, honey, and other farm products. And everything is grown on the farm or made by members of the family that sold in the market. Uh, we recently opened a website and we use Facebook, especially for our farm market information, uh, growth and sales. And our farm has continued to evolve over the years. The model has changed again and again and again uh, due to changes in the business, demand, customer traffic and family interests. We see a continuing change in our customers based on trends in world affairs and incoming populations from all over the world. Thanks. Thank you, Karen. Um, at this time, I would love to introduce um, Joe Emenheiser, who is our livestock specialist at UConn Extension, to tell us a little bit about what he does. All right, well, thank you for the opportunity to be here and to, uh, to see some faces. Um, I'm Joe Emenheiser, a UConn Extension livestock specialist uh, or, or UConn Extension educator. Um, they call me the diversified livestock specialist, but diversified specialist is kind of an oxymoron. So um, we're, we're still trying <laughs> to figure out what that means. Um, and, and the long and short of it is that I work with uh, primarily meat producing animals. Um, and, and so that the main charges of my extension position are economic development of the livestock industry for the state and also uh, meat quality improvement. And, and the latter is uh, a large part of what I've spent, um, you know, at least my academic career, uh, working on. Um, in a previous life, I've also worked on farms and worked in, in several meat businesses and, and had a lot of exposure to the, the marketing side of things. And um, you know, one of the maybe most important lessons that I've learned uh, in terms of diversity, you know, we think about diversified farms as you know, as having every single animal or, or something like that. And I think that that's a little bit of a misnomer. I think that, uh, you know, there's a balance in finding what's, what's important to you or what you do well uh, and doing one or two things well um, and realizing that that's still going to have variable results. And uh, so the importance of diversity, you know, that, that I discovered at least over my career with marketing was uh, you know maybe having one enterprise, but having multiple markets within that that allowed you some flexibility to uh, to stay viable and um, you know different types of lambs or different types of calves that came out of the same breeding program all had a home because of how the the marketing system was uh, was set up and so um, you know really what I came to realize was that that balance between producing what you market and marketing what you produce. And I think that, uh, you know, many times we spend a lot of time, uh, you know, just thinking about how to market what we have as a, as a reactive sort of uh, approach. And, and it's, it's better to back up and find an identified market and, and produce for that as, you know, as each of the speakers here, uh, you know, has outlined and does very well. Um, we've got a real opportunity, uh, speaking from a, a meat standpoint, in New England right now, especially after COVID with the demand for local meats um, and the opportunities to, to step up to that demand, which supply is falling short of right now. Uh, the, the academic in me, uh, the researcher in me says, let's make sure we do that with a quality product. And um, so I, I will give a number of presentations and, and I talk a lot about consistency and sometimes I'm misconstrued, uh, you know, and where I'm trying to you know, make New England agriculture model the, the commodity industry and so forth. And that's not been my, my approach at all. Um, but I think that consistency is critically important within a product or within a market to make sure that, that our customers stay repeat. And uh, so one of the key tools for that, and in my opinion, is just objective measurements, objective measurements on the animals, objective measurements on the meat products themselves, and, and making sure that the marketing and the dialogue that we're doing includes 
you know, not just not just our story and not just our production protocols, which are, are absolutely important, but also making sure that they include objective, measurable attributes to the products themselves. Uh, you know, is this product going to be consistently tender and juicy and flavorful? And how can I how can I verify that? Um, is this going to be consistently high yielding or is the fat going to be variable throughout the year, etc.? Um, one of the tools that I use a lot to, uh, to measure that in live animals, uh, which also helps with breeding decisions, is ultrasound. And I've done a lot of ultrasound work uh, with sheep and with cattle in, in a previous life and have an ultrasound machine here at UConn. And, and that's, uh, that's a big part of where I see myself plugging into the industry is helping producers um, to, to measure what they have, to make sure that they better target the parameters that their market is looking for uh, and that they're objectively marketing. Um, because no matter what we're doing, we all can improve. And, uh, and, and then no matter what we're doing is also important because every single one of these operations, every single one of production systems is going to look different. Uh, it, it's, um, there's not a, a right answer. It's what's a matter of works for you. And, that's why these kind of panels are so valuable because we can all get different ideas and, and piece things together, but ultimately uh, we do it for ourselves. And the beauty of, of the ultrasound work that I do or, or just carcass measurements, meat quality work is that it doesn't matter what your market is. It doesn't matter what labels you've ascribed to your production protocols. Um, you know, I can work with all of you. I can work with you to uh, objectively measure what you're producing and do better within your system and toward your, your own goals. So that's, uh, that's my quick stump speech. Looking forward to the, the talk here and uh, thanks for the time. Awesome, thank you so much, Joe. Um, now we're gonna take a moment to just a little bit more formally introduce Nick Weinstock, who's with us on the panel. And just Nick, if I don't know if you want to add to your video or the conversation as we're kind of in this introductory period still before we go into some broader questions. Yeah, I don't but. think I have too much more to add. Um, okay. I think the video covered quite a bit. <laughs> um, <Nick>. Yes, <laughs> it did. I just wanted to give everybody an opportunity to give a shout out for um, you being part of the panel and certainly you know, as we go into questions, we're going to love to hear what everybody has to say, including you. So, um, Becca, you can keep us posted, um, encouraging all the audience to, um, if you have any questions, uh, please put them in the chat. If it's for a particular producer, just put that in. Um, we're going to start with a, um, a few questions now and uh, keep the conversation going. So. Um, First, we're going to start off with, um, let's see. Kind of at your farm product level, was this um, something that was a total novel idea that you had as far as going into whatever production model that you have, or were you inspired by other business people? And if you want to share who and where they are briefly, um, I think that this would be a great question for each of you to answer in a short way. So um, I think, Nick, I will start with you um, and we'll pass it along after. Yeah, I, uh, I got inspired by trying to hunt out high quality meat for myself. Um, I found a farm, I was down in, living in New Jersey at the time, and I found a local farm to me who was raising pasture-based uh, pork. I was looking for pork in particular. And I visited her farm one day just to see the animals being raised. And she gave me an awesome two-hour tour of her farm. And um, at the end of the tour, I realized I kind of wasted two hours of her what looked like a busy day. So I offered to help her finish out her day. I had nothing else to do. And she took me up on that. And then uh, I kind of, every every week a few times a week i would reach out to her on my way home from work hey do you need help do you need a hand um and it turned out to be a, a great learning experience and really got me jump started into uh wanting to do it myself and sometime in the two years working with her decided to pull the trigger on it and start doing it ourselves
Nancy, you're muted. Thanks, Nick. Um, I'm going to jump in and ask Kirsten uh, the same question. Was there anyone in particular you guys were inspired by? Um, and if so, what part was that? Um, there's honestly, there's just that when we first started, there's just, there wasn't many producers of what we were looking to do, which initially it was just going to be chicken. And then like chicken's the gateway drug into farming. We all know this, <laughs> you know, most of us have backyard flocks anyway. Um, but we couldn't find anybody that produced a high quality product where we would know the farm or excuse me, know the farm, know the farmer and be able to see their animals. Um, I have an aunt in Vermont who, uh, she's direct family on the land that we're currently farming. And every time I'd go up there, I mean, they're pretty much homesteaders. Uh, and so we go up there and she pull out pork that, you know, she bartered some of the chickens that she raised for, or beef that one of her friends raised. And it was just like this whole community that they just get, they, they seem to get food and the value of good food and the value of homegrown and home raised food. And so when I was just kind of trying to figure out what I wanted to do and my husband, Chris, what we wanted to do, it was kind of this aunt in Vermont, we kind of just felt onto and said, okay, well, how did you do this? Like she was the one that told us the hatchery that we now get all of our chicks from, you know? So I guess we kind of piggybacked on her a little bit, but being so far away, we were looking for something down here in Connecticut and there really wasn't anything. And so we were just like, you know what, let's just do it. And so we did it. And we started with a really small flock of chickens and now we're bigger and getting more. And then, you know, turkeys were the next stage in the evolution. And then, you know, pig, most, a lot of pigs in this country, it's a lot of chickens are shipped overseas for slaughter. And it's like, when you hear this stuff, it's just mind blowing that why don't we do more? I mean, I know land access is hard and we're, for, we're very fortunate to have what we have right now. But, you know, as a backyard producer, you can raise a few meat birds. And I think it was, that's kind of where we started and then we kind of grew and it's pretty awesome. So now I, I hope to be that person that people can come to and say, hey, show me, tell me how you, how you did this. Let me kind of shadow you. Let me be, I want to be that person for these people coming up who want to learn. And there's value in that. And, and I think so many more of these small farms are doing it and there's so much more access to really, really good high quality food now these days, which is kind of awesome. That's awesome, Chris, Kirsten. Um, now I'm gonna um, ask uh, Karen the same question and to see if I know that you have multiple businesses at your farm, but specifically maybe the um, lamb and goat that you currently are marketing to the ethnic markets, was there an inspiration for that? Or how did that particular part of the business roll out for you? You know, we've, um, we've been continually evolving. And I mean, my grandparents had a small farm that they delivered milk and cucumbers. And my, the dairy grew and we were gifted to lambs. So we went through a whole period where we had these Cheviots and we only raised them. I mean, the only sales we had were for the uh, traditional Christian Easter. Uh, and along the way, the rest of the Mediterranean, we've, we've evolved basically from customer demand. Um, then the Mediterranean uh, sales picked up. Uh, we had the Portuguese, we had the Greeks. Um, with the, with the sheep. Uh, but then we started to find that we needed a bigger product. And so over the years, we um, transitioned to larger breeds and um, of people who wanted a larger animal. And so then we were, um, we've gone through, it's all initiated by the customer for us. Um, we have gone through, you know, a number of different populations, um, and that's really what has driven it for us. Um, everything that we've done, there was an inquiry. We only had sheep for uh, 30 years, and uh, when I um, started to get ready to retire, 
um, like the, our ethnic customers were saying, well, could you have a few goats? And so I have a few, um, but everything has come really based on customer demand. And that's kind of how we've evolved. Awesome. Thank you for sharing, Karen. I, I know that it seems a little bit, um, you know, archaic almost in these times, but word of mouth is so, so strong, I think, for all of us um, that you cannot put a price on that. I think that, you know, for myself and I'm feeling like for the, you know, the panel at large, you know, you kind of start because it's a product that you want for yourself and your family and you have siblings or you, you know, grew up that way. And then someone's at a barbecue and they ask about it and it just, you know, it's, it's it, small incremental, but when you have that kind of um, a recommendation from someone who's tried your products, it, it's a, it's, it's valuable. So I appreciate you. that. For years, we never did anything but business cards. And uh, when people came and they did or didn't have our phone number, we never gave them one. We'd give them four or five. And people would arrive with a card in their hand. And um, that was what drove it. I mean, our Facebook presence really only happened with the market. Um, and, but we had gone to a presentation that you had run four years ago thinking, that might be something that we wanted to do. And, um, but we still, our biggest tool is still our business cards. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Uh, Joe, do you have anything from personal story of inspiration or, um, you know, at your university level that you'd like to share? Yeah, I mean, honestly, it goes way, way back for me. And, uh, you know, one of my key interests has been genetics. And when I was a little kid, I nobody believes me, but I had a cat that I had trained to go out in the rafters of the barn and bring back baby, baby pigeons. And I bred them for different colors. And I had the stream in our front yard dammed up and I had different minnow projects. And, uh, you know, obviously as I matured, I, I started to realize that it, it would be more sustainable if I had a, an application for that interest that, uh, that fed people or provided something uh, to, to other people. So I just became really interested in systems and, um, you know, how do you, how do you apply that, that continual improvement and trying to, to make a population, an animal population serve your needs. Uh, mm -hmm. And so that kind of drove my interest in, in industries. And uh, I mean, I grew up on a very small farm. My parents were both teachers. Um, you know, I, they, they both, died pretty young and I was not in a position to uh, to, to inherit or, or purchase a farm of my own and so I went the academic track uh, and and in between every degree I did the best I could to uh, to escape ap academia probably uh, you know I went to get my hands dirty worked on farms or uh, worked in cutting meat but uh, you know the, the security of, of the income and the ability to help other people kind of always led me back here and and so um you know, that's that's my story i mean i could talk about similar you know marketing evolutions like like karen did with with it being customer driven and the farms that i've been on and the the various ethnic customers or uh you know hell's kitchen new york area clientele or, or random things that they asked us to find and we did just because we could and uh throw them along in the load um but that's what it is you know you you identify who you want to serve and and follow their needs but also make sure that it fits your own system um, you know your your resources on your farm um, and your ability to produce and something that you can do well um, Jenny do you have a particular um, farm or person who was an inspiration to your you and Dan I'll be fast. For the sake of time, I already discussed it when I introduced myself yeah. that we just always felt there was a better way um, based on the animal health and well-being that was occurring on his family's dairy. And then um, mm -hmm. I have a whole slew of medical issues that I have completely resolved due to dietary intake. 
And so this was like this perfect storm for us about his passion and desire, my husband's passion and desire for agriculture. I didn't think when I said I do, I was going to be a farmer. <laughs> um, and here we are 21 years later, and now I have advocated for um, an ordinance in our community for an ag commission. I've been the chair since 2015, like clearly I'm born bred educator, as Joe said, you know, like I am going to use my every platform I can to preach um, about agriculture, even though the model we use on our farm is very specific to us. Um, mm -hmm. We are very pro ag. So, you know, mm -hmm. I always am giving references to everybody who comes to my farm. Well, if we don't have the product for you, believe me, I know people who do. So just tell me what you're looking for and I will, I will get you that name and number. So um, I will say that we, our inspiration actually came from touring the country and attending conferences outside of Connecticut because Connecticut, when we began, did not, and, and I'm going to use the did not, I'm going to use an absolute here, did not really embrace this idea of feeding your animals from your land. Um, you know, and so we needed to go somewhere else to, to actually seek that inspiration. So we spent a lot of time in New York, a lot of time in Vermont. We have now gone to um, South Dakota. We're headed to Texas um, in May to be with other like-minded farmers because that's where we gain our inspiration and that's where we gain our energy for new ideas and how to be innovative in what we're currently doing. Perfect. Well, I appreciate you sharing, Jenny. Um, <clears throat> I have a question, question from the chat, Nancy, if I can sure, go, ahead. go ahead and uh, put that out there. Um, Jenny, I'm going to go ahead and put you back on the spot because the question was kind of directed towards you. Um, both Andrew and Megan were curious about um, your pasture rotation methods, uh, especially Megan wanted to hear more about what does that mean in regards to winter rotation, changing climate, tons of mud? We all know about the mud. <laughs> um, so I guess, Jenny, if you want to start us off, and then if everybody wants to go ahead and give us a brief um, kind of talk about what they do for rotational grazing and um, how that impacts your system. Rebecca, um, Andrew, you better believe it. It is very unique to every um, farm and every situation. Um, we each have our own funky corners and valleys and wet spots and um, dry spots and spots that don't perform quite well. And I will be honest with you, it probably took me a good six years before I finally found the method that worked for me. I was going out there every day to create individual paddocks. And it took me time to figure out how do I take all of these reels and this pile of pigtails to make single lines more efficient. So sometimes I, I'm happy to share it with anyone who comes here to show you what I learned and how I got to where I got. And then hopefully you can springboard from my ideas. Um, but sometimes trial and error really allows you the opportunity to go, okay, that, that was really bad. That didn't work. I can't do this every day. I'm stressed. I have kids who are screaming for meals. I have, you know, work obligations and I have animals that are mooing because they need to be fed. And then I developed a system of essentially large, and unfortunately, I don't have this in a slide on this, this deck, but um, I created large rectangles. I, when I mean large, I mean like two and a half acre rectangles. And then I divided those up into like basketball sized courts. And then I run my strings much longer distances. So now when I come home from work, I just reel a basketball court length, done and move and we're over. Um, and I run what's called the back line. And I think Nick likes to call it a forward line. The same concept, you just are moving a line forward in your pasture, but getting that herd out before they start to nip at new growth in the beginning. So it's all about that balance. Um, so Andrew, I think anyone on this call has really great innovative ideas about how they, you know, move their infrastructure internally, um, but you always have to consider water sources. We do not mind making our animals move back to their water. Um, we don't do tubs. It's just not what we can do um, and the waters work for us and our herd is just fine. We do have to be careful about animal behavior because that means we're creating alleys or lanes back to water. So that's something that you always wanna consider. So I shift my lanes over um, as I'm simultaneously moving the herd. The other thing about winter management, I think it was Megan, um, 
it's no different than summer management because remember all of our farms have wet spots. So there's a section of my farm that I have to watch out even if it's July. Um, if we get a funky rain, my infiltration in that area is not as good. So I have to always have that backup plan. Where can I suddenly move my herd if I know I'm coming into a window? Because I absolutely do not want to destroy all the hard work we've gotten to. And destroying, I mean by animal impact. They'll go in there, they'll dig it all up, and now I've just ruined five years of work in 50 15 minutes. Um, so I always have that exit plan. Um, so in the winter, it's the same. I create the same very large two and a half acre kind of paddocks. I move my trailer based on that trend. So you bring up a great point. We are coming into mild weather over the next three days. So this was a discussion I had with my husband this morning about how he can help me move to what I would refer to our Silvo areas where it's a hair more sacrificial. So I'm not as concerned if they, they rut it up a little bit. It's not quite right what we want it to be on our farm, but I always have that backup plan, that exit strategy to move my herd where it needs to go. And then I document it in my records. You know, the nature is out of our control. We just have to adapt and modify to um, meet where she is at. I certainly awesome. want to give other people an opportunity to share because they all have great grazing sure. ideas. Joe, I think you have your hand up. Can do you want to speak for a little bit on that? Yeah, I think Jenny really uh, covered that quite well. Just one other consideration that came to mind, uh, you know, that 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 comes up as a question or a big big issue for a lot of different producers is uh, in that grazing system and that rotation, uh, how and where do you handle the young stock? Uh, and so, for example, I was uh, for my for my dissertation dissertation project at Virginia Tech. I was involved with the grass-fed beef systems project, and we had a, uh, I mean, the, the beauty of, of uh, beef grazing down there was that there were winters that we fed hay for fewer than 30 days out of the year, and everything else was stockpiled grass. Uh, it sounds a little bit far-reaching here, but that could be where we're headed in terms of climate change, too, so uh, you know, some, uh, some considerations. Anyway, um, Two of the systems that we evaluated in those cow-calf systems were uh, the difference between a designated creep paddock that was seeded specially and, uh, and central in the, in the grazing system and the calves always had access to it versus a, a forward creeping system where the calves had access to the next paddock in the rotation that the cows were coming, uh, coming into. And uh, just there's no magic answers, but there are differences in infrastructure costs, there's differences in the mechanics, there's differences in the nutrition that uh, you have to find what works for your system. Uh, another big consideration outside of the beef picture is in the small ruminant side, uh, the issues with parasitism that are affecting many, many, many people. Uh, you know, mature animals and young animals innately will have different levels of, of immunity to parasites. And so, thinking about how to handle those simultaneously in the same, um, same rotational system. Uh, big considerations, no magic answers, but, uh, but some questions that kind of can be uniformly asked across everybody. Awesome. All right, I'm gonna pose a question now um, to both Nick and Kirsten. Um, what was one of your challenges or barriers um, that you faced when entering into the business and what did, how did it change what you were doing? I know that the time is going by really fast with our question and answers. So we wanna kind of try to help out some of our new and beginning farmers with some of the, the addressing of entry issues. Nick, do you wanna go first? Sure. <laughs> um... I think our biggest uh, entry issue was finding the right land. We had developed a, a well thought through business plan um, requiring a lot from our, our land and, and um, we knew what it, it needed to look like or at least a rough idea of how many acres and uh, we weren't looking for any infrastructure. We were going to do all that ourselves. Obviously anything would have helped, but um, looking for the acreage we wanted and within the state limits. We wanted to be as close to New Haven as possible, actually, that was our target market. Um, we're an hour and 10 minutes from New Haven, so we're nowhere close, but it, it was the only place we could find land that we could afford. Um, we didn't want to go into a lease. We wanted to make this a permanent thing. We knew we were gonna drop a lot of money into infrastructure. Um, 
So we, we wanted to find that land. That was, that was probably the most difficult thing to get started, mm-hmm. but it's out there. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Sometimes it takes a while to find, find it or find the right piece. But yep. um, Kirsten, how about for you and um, Chris? Sorry, the land was, um, the land also is a tough thing. Uh, the state is not cheap. It's not easy to get in if you don't have access already. We, like I said, we're fortunate that we had family land, but again, we're leasing it. So if anything were to happen, we can be off that property and with, you know, the snap of fingers and we would have lost, we would lose our entire business. So owning, not owning something like land is incredibly difficult. Um, in the financial aspect of it. I mean, we, we didn't grow fast. Our growth has been very slow and we were afraid to take out a loan because it's a huge commitment when you're not sure if you could pay it back um, it's gonna it, under the end. right terms. I don't think people have been asking. What? Go ahead. I think uh, someone was on mute, uh, unmuted for a moment. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, financial, uh, we weren't, um, because as a new farm, you're, you don't have credit, you don't have a his, credit history, you don't have financial histories. And a lot of these banks weren't going to give us a loan. They weren't going to lend us any money. And so we relied a lot on family. Um, this was the first year we've actually taken out a line of credit, a substantial line of credit to build our processing facility. And this, and it took us seven years to say, okay, we really just need to invest and the way for us to invest because my husband and I don't have off farm jobs. This is our full-time gig. Um, So we we are working with our local bank and it's been great now that we have more than three years of a financial history, but it's tough. Land access and and financial means if you don't have it to start is probably the biggest barriers of entry. Um, I noticed someone had mentioned uh, processing of the animals, that's that's another huge thing. Um, you have to have an outlet of sale. And in order to have an outlet of sale, you have to be able to actually get your animals to market, um, sorry, to process, uh, to processing. And this, it's difficult. Uh, the only poultry processor most people go to is in Rhode Island. And now you're driving, depending on where you are, an hour and a half each way. And then you got to pay for your birds or whatever to, to get slaughtered. Same thing with our pork. We actually go up to Massachusetts. Um, it's tough. And with the pandemic, it's gotten even harder because a lot of people now are looking at local slaughterhouses and they're getting overrun. They don't have the people to work it. So it's, it's tough. There's a, there's a bunch of things, but if you can figure it out, the ride's worthwhile. Awesome. So I appreciate you kind of doing a segue right into that question, Kirsten. Um, So one of the questions really kind of pairs with that. And it's just, are there any auxiliary businesses that are needed for your work or products to thrive? So I think I'm going to just ask that in a short, sweet way, I'm guessing that everybody on the panel would agree with the the bottleneck at the slaughterhouses. But if you just kind of want to go around not to get too deep in the weeds because then we don't have time to solve that issue, unfortunately, today. But if there was an additional um, business that, you know, really pairs, you know, and is critical in your business thriving as well, in addition to the slaughterhouses. So, um, Nick, do you want to go first on that one? Yeah, obviously, the slaughterhouses are are a big problem, but um, you got to plan ahead. <laughs> that, that's all it is. Uh, yeah. planning two years out uh, with the slaughterhouse and my, my personal plan is closer to three years. So um, mm-hmm. other businesses we, we rely on, we do a lot of value added stuff. So we rely on uh, a commercial kitchen. Um, Click is a, uh, a great one. It's a co-op kitchen that we use to process all of our value added products at. Um, we also rely on some other local people to do with the, our wool processing and hide processing. Um, they're, they're, I, it's something well above that, what I want to do. Um, mm-hmm. And then I guess a big one is feed producers. Um, we don't use anybody locally because we couldn't find anybody locally to make the feed to the highest quality that we wanted. So we're, we're shipping in from Virginia uh, and upstate mm-hmm. New York um, for our feed. Uh, and mm-hmm. We've gone to multiple mills locally and nobody wants to touch it. So... Mm-hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Karen, how about for you on the um, auxiliary business question? Here we are. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> the slaughterhouse is an issue with our market. Uh, October to December, um, there is far too much demand. Uh, but the problem is, um, if you expand it to that level, there are parts of the rest of the year that it's not going to be economically feasible for those slaughterhouses to maintain their staff. Uh, that is going to be difficult to reconcile. <clears throat> the other one is we do feed grain. Um, there are no processors in Connecticut. So anything is really brought in from out of state. There might be some small processors, but um, that's one business we do depend on. We do use grain. Um, it certainly helps with the final condition of our animals. And then biggest um, one, of course, is equipment supplies and repairs, particularly on agricultural equipment, uh, particularly on tractors. Um, the infrastructure um, no longer is sufficient in Connecticut. Awesome. Well, thank you for sharing those. Um, um, Jenny, do you have any thoughts on any of the auxiliary businesses that you need to have your business thrive? So I appreciate Karen's comment. However, my husband's mechanically inclined. So um, we do all our own um, machinery repairs. Um, we, when, when you break a belt on your mower, you, on your disc mine, you certainly buy two or three, you know, like when that, you're not gonna make that mistake twice. So we keep a, you know, a plethora of things here for us. So we have that skill set to be able to do a lot of our own maintenance and repair. For us, the biggest um, barrier that we face regarding the reliance on, on other businesses will always come back to our slaughter facility. Um, we slaughter at about 28 to 29 months. So we want to stay under the 30 month threshold for USDA processing. However, um, we personally prefer the flavor, the depth of flavor, um, the long, you know, we would love to process animals four years old, but we can't afford to keep losing the backbones out of them. Um, so, and, you know, so that's a barrier, but we can handle the timelines now. COVID has regulated. We can handle getting our animals in. We understand the system that our slaughterhouse is working under now. We struggle with that. They still don't do it right. So, um, you know, we bring our product in. We always want inch and a half cuts on our steak. We brought two steers in a month ago, picked them up, and they're all th three quarters of an inch. Like, I can't fix that. I can't undo what came back to me. I, I have clients that are now going, we, what happened here? Um, and I'm like, I'm sorry, my hands are tied. Like, we have expectations we follow their procedures and their cut sheets and this is what we got back, you know? And so, you know, then we're spending time pivoting to apologize to our clients who, you know, appreciate the products that we make yet. This is something that's completely out of our control. So it's always the slaughterhouse for me. Sure. Yeah. Uh, valid and definitely not fallen on deaf ears here. So we, can really appreciate that. I think we've all had our issues and you just try to mitigate and keep the window open for all of the slaughterhouses really that are in New England, if at all possible, because there is such a bottleneck. I mean, certainly. All right, um, I would like to um, go into another question about um, what is your method of um, making- Before we go on to that, I think Joe had something he wanted to comment on. Oh, sure, yeah. I, I just wanted to jump in real quickly and, and say that, uh, you know, and Karen touched on it nicely, uh, you know, it, it's real easy to approach the, the slaughter and processing bottleneck from the producer side, uh, but there's also producer, or the, the, there's also processor considerations there and reasons why uh, that bottleneck ex exists. And, and if it was profitable for a processor to be here, they would. Uh, and, and so it's important, just two real quick thoughts on this. Uh, one, to the extent that you can uh, talk to the processors and make it, make it a dialogue and try to the best that we can to understand that, that we're all part of the same stream and it's not 
and us versus them. Uh, and, and there are, uh, there are a number of, of legislative initiatives and funding packages available that, that I think are going to start to change that, that face quickly, but, uh, but focus on the dialogue. And two, um, to the extent that it's possible when producers can, can get together, uh, whether it's to, to aggregate animals to increase numbers or to manage their supply to coordinate that with, with the, the processor, or even just to unite the voice to be able to have a, a unified message to go to the legislature that, that says we are collectively struggling with this issue and together, uh, you know, this, this voice can't be ignored, uh, that there's power in, in getting together around the issue. And so I think that's, uh, that's also a path forward that's going to be absolutely critical. Uh, so I think we have time for one more quick question, Nancy. But uh, before we move on to that, I just want to remind everyone, if uh, you before you leave, if you would be just willing to fill out our survey again, it would be very helpful to us uh, going forward with other webinars. Uh, I've put that link in the chat so you can access that right away, but we'll also be sending it with the recording. So Nancy, do you want to take our panelists through our final question? Gosh, the time went by so fast and we have so many great questions, but I guess um, I, I will end with this one. What is your method of making informed decisions? Um, you know, it could be market demand, records, land access, time constraints, kind of time constraints and um, you know, what would you encourage a new grower to like base, you know, like their business on? Like, what do you find are your, your best, what is the best information for making those decisions? So yeah, let's start with, we're gonna have everybody answer kind of, so we'll go around Robin, we'll start with Nick. Uh, data collection. <laughs> Collect everything you possibly can. I know Jenny showed a lot of it off. Uh, I probably saved more than her, if that's possible. Um, collect everything. If you can get a number on it, if you can get a picture of it, if you can get anything, collect it. Um, you don't know what you're going to need when you start out. Um, save everything. <laughs> and then you can start paring down from there when you actually... Mm -hmm. grow the business and learn what you need but but not only save it but go back and look um mm -hmm. look at what you're saving look at what you're doing in the past look how how things change and just analyze the data that you have um mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> great all right and kirsten how about for you and chris i'm not so much of a data collector numbers and me don't um we just don't get along we do keep records um but I look at an Excel spreadsheet and it's pretty much Latin to me. Um, so maybe my take on this is a little bit different if for those people that aren't good with, um, with numbers. Um, so what we do is we really just, it's thought and time and patience. Watching your land, understanding your land, understanding your animals, um, reaching out to your suppliers, seeing if they're increasing costs. How much are they increasing? Can you lock down numbers with those suppliers? Um, planning ahead. I mean, we're, I can process 20,000 chickens this year if I'm certified. Am I going to do it? No, because I, we cannot handle it. Our land cannot handle it. So um, we take a look at Data is important for sure. Um, we do look and understand past season, um, especially when you're dealing with animals and you're raising them outdoors, understanding the environment is constantly changing. You're going to have a year of drought. You're going to have five inches in a day like we did last year multiple times. Um, so we need to kind of plan accordingly. Uh, we know where low spots are. We know where to move our animals to. Um, training of the animals, especially pigs, when you get, or cows or lamb or sheep, when you get them on pasture. Uh, some decision-making is all about just understanding what you're working with and really focusing on what you can do better for the land, for the animals, for yourselves, make your life easier. Uh, farming is hard. 
and it's con it's ever changing. You're never going to have the same year. You're never going to have the same animals and you're never going to be the same person you were. And so be dynamic and be fluid and be ready to humble, get humbled. And, and there's no such thing as failing in anything. Anytime you think you're failing or you're making a mistake, this is just a huge learning opportunity. And it is so important to see, to understand that. And farming isn't black and white. Um, rolling with those changes and communicating is huge um, as far as decision making goes. I mean, it's huge. You got to talk to all parties you're involved with. We lease land. A lot of our decisions have to go through family members, the people who own the land. Um, we got to talk to our volunteers. We got to, if we hire people, you got to talk to other people. I mean, it's Informed decision-making is not just a couple of things. It is a whole broad picture for us. Um, we look at past seasons a lot and we assume, I mean, <laughs> we don't know what we're getting into this season. Um, we're hoping it's like one of the past seasons we dealt with. So we kind of understand it more, but financial records are important. Market demand is important or demand skyrocketed. Here we are, we're growing. I can keep going, but I'm not going to do that. So <laughs> you guys can ask me another time. <laughs> well, in lieu of the time being very close to 12, in case anybody has to um, leave, I would like to give um, the rest of the panelists an opportunity to finish at least this question. But just in this one 30-second interim, um, Becca has several times put the survey in the chat. Those are That's really important. So please take a couple minutes to do that. We definitely wanted to just thank the panelists for sharing all their knowledge with us today and their inspiring and entrepreneurial businesses. Um, just know that UConn Extension is here to help you succeed and acquire the knowledge and skills. So on that evaluation, just tell us what your needs are and we're gonna try to be here for you. So just give us a call. Um, so I'm gonna pop over and ask um, Jenny, then Karen, and then Joe if you wanna follow up just to answer this question in the next few minutes, and then we'll be all set for the morning. Great, so um, I have a quote that was on the first slide that says, I believe that all people should be an innovator for agriculture. Don't be afraid to try new things. You will learn so much from making mistakes and taking leaps of faith. So I would say for me, this is about balance, right? You heard that we have off-farm jobs, so we're always trying to balance our time constraints. Um, we right now, with, with the exception of laying hens, our primary production is cattle that we finish at 30 months. So if you do the math there, if we make a mistake in month three, that's a pretty long recovery time um, to, to write that, that hiccup. Um, I, because I don't think of them as mistakes. I think of them as learning curves. But when you think about um, raising larger species, you know, I'm 44. So if I can farm for 30 more years, right? Like, I hope not. But um, if I can, that's only 30 years, 30 times I get to make decisions because my seasons are set up that way. They're structured that way. Um, and because I rely on the, the land, which I'm very thankful that because of the decisions we make, we don't get impacted by droughts or um, excessive rainfalls because of the practices we implement here. So fortunately for me, I have eliminated some of those variables that used to be nemesis for me. Um, so I would just say balance. Um, if you talk about to my husband, um, he's going to say budget because he doesn't have one. It's me reining him in all the time. And I'm like, the farm can't support that. That's your off-farm job trying to do that. And so reining him into making sure that he realizes that what can our farm actually sustain. So balance. I need balance. Awesome. Thanks, Jenny. Um, Karen, do you want to speak to that for um, us on... Uh, decision making. Sure. Um, let's see. The um, you know, there's a phrase that we use often. There are needs and there are wants, and you have to really work within the confines. And needs and wants are really dictated by economics. Um, we do have a family. Um, group of people that have a discussion, um, but there is also uh, sometimes things that present themselves to you that uh, you simply cannot 
look away from. And maybe it expands in an area or a little farther than we'd like, um, but then we turn around and look as if it's something we're gonna continue. So uh, at the base of it is economics, but more importantly is the manpower. Do we have the manpower? Because we are not a one or two person operation. Um, we have to make sure we have the manpower to, to uh, survive the decisions of expansion or variations of what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Awesome, great. And Joe, how about a few closing words of wisdom for, for all uh, of us and our decision-making? That's a lot of pressure. It is. Uh, I mean, the, the one word that, that uh, Jenny said that, that jumped out to me and, and actually uh, there's pieces from, from what everyone has said, but just uh, she talked about sustaining and I, I'm thinking about sustainable agriculture and there's, you know, the, the three legs of the sustainability stool, which are, you know, is this economically viable? Is it ecologically sound? And is it socially acceptable uh, for your production system? But there's, there's one piece of that that's also really important to understand or to consider. And that's, is this working for me? You know, is it working for me? Is it working for us? If you're working with a partner or a family and over the course of, of my journey, I mean, there have been a lot of very interesting things that I've done that worked great for a while. And then after a, a while, for whatever reason, um, you know, either the market dried up or other opportunities pre presented themselves, it was time to move on. And uh, so in a natural system, you know, sustainability is just the adaptability to change. And, and sometimes in, in agriculture, with our emphasis on buzzwords, we think about sustainable ag as a certain way of doing something. But I think that's pretty fundamentally narrow. I think I think what's really sustainable is just being open-minded and being being able to to move and to change and adapt as as you need to. Uh, so that's not really anything different than what anyone else has said. Just kind of a, a maybe a different way of framing it. Um, mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, I really and truly appreciate all of you guys being here today and rounding out these discussions. I think it was really helpful for all of us to hear whether we're brand new to livestock or we've been around it for a while. There's always a new and different way to look at things and to hear about it and make that little light bulb moment go out off in your head and to maybe change something on your own farm. So Thank you guys for all your words of wisdom. It was really great to have you all at the table here today. And 